They were my magic shows. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Jared Frederick and welcome to yet another episode of Real History. I think we are in for a real treat with today's segment, a movie that is very much beloved and I'm sure that many of you have seen and that is Robert Zemeckis' 1994 comedy drama, Forrest Gump. It's on TV practically every week. I suspect the uh, vast majority of Americans have seen this film and even though its main character and storyline are fictional, it touches on many historical themes that offer some very revealing truths about America in the 1960s and the 1970s and that is exactly what we are going to be discussing on this episode. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started on Forrest Gump. Hello. My name's Forrest, Forrest Gump. The opening of this movie itself takes place in a very historic environment. Uh, this area is known as Chippewa Square and it is located in the historic district of Savannah, Georgia. Uh, one of the most uh, historic and one of the oldest American cities uh, along the, the East Coast. And in many ways, it's an appropriate setting to begin this very historical tale. Mama named me after the great Civil War hero, General Nathan Bedford Forrest. She said we was related to him in some way. And what For those of you who may not have noticed, um, that is actually uh, Tom Hanks who dressed up as Nathan Bedford Forrest. And what essentially is recreated here in these opening scenes is uh, Zemeckis is giving a, a tip of the hat to the D.W. Griffith 1915 silent epic, uh, The Birth of a Nation, in which the Ku Klux Klan is depicted as the saviors of the post-Civil War South. Um, and so it's a very interesting cinematic montage that we see here at the beginning. All right. What are y'all staring at? Haven't you ever seen a little boy with braces on his legs before? It's important to keep in mind at this time, uh, hundreds of thousands of children were uh, afflicted by polio, which uh, essentially uh, destroyed their body's ability to produce muscle cells, uh, often in, in the lower part of their bodies. Um, and so uh, young children who were forced age uh, wearing braces uh, was far more common than what we may have originally thought. I told you not to bother this nice young man. Oh, no, that's all right, man. I, I was just showing him a thing or two on the guitar here. Fun little bit of trivia about this uh, a cameo with Elvis Presley's character uh, is that uh, the voice is provided by actor Kurt Russell, uh, who himself, as a young man growing up in the 1960s, uh, acted with Elvis Presley in, uh, in some of his movies. Um, and so here, too, is yet another homage to this earlier time in cinematic history. Sights taken. Sights taken. Hey, stupid! Quit it! Run, Forrest, run! Hey! Did you hear me, stupid? As the song is playing here, one of the, the really one of many memorable traits of the film is its soundtrack. The, the soundtrack itself was uh, best-selling on compact discs shortly after uh, the film came out. And I think one reason why that is so is because uh, so many people could connect to the songs within the soundtrack. It wasn't just a traditional score. It was all of these classic hits from the 1950s through the 1970s. And uh, there's a lot of good toe-tapping tunes that uh, were on many people's favorite lists. Who in the hell is that? That there is false gum, coach. Just a local idiot. And here is where we are introduced to Bear Bryant, coach at Alabama, who uh, racked up a number of national championships throughout the 1960s and the 1970s, six to be exact, um, including one in 1964 and 1965. And uh, the film right at this moment is, uh, I believe, set in 1963. So uh, presumably in subsequent seasons, uh, Forrest was on at least one of those uh, championship teams. 
with us. I do? Shortly after Governor Wallace had carried out his promise to block the doorway, President Kennedy ordered the Secretary of Defense then to use military force. It was not too long before this incident uh, that George Wallace was inaugurated as the, the segregationist governor of Alabama and standing in the very same place where Jefferson Davis had been inaugurated as the first and only president of the Confederacy. Uh, George Wallace very vehemently declared segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And uh, this in part culminated in his uh, June 1963 stand in front of the university uh, in defiance of uh, federal rulings demanding the, the desegregation of the university. And uh, of course, he eventually had to give way uh, to the National Guard, but it was one of these uh, iconic moments in uh, the long and, and rocky journey toward uh, civil rights because there was really uh, few Southern governors of this caliber uh, who were as vocal as George Wallace was in maintaining the racial status quo in the Deep South. Because Jenny went to a college I couldn't go to. It was a college just for girls. But I go and visit her every chance I got. It's an interesting conversation to be had about co-ed schools um, and the, the types of institutions of higher learning in the 1950s and the 1960s because, of course, um, many universities still prohibited women uh, to a, a large extent. Um, so it may seem somewhat alien to uh, students of today, but um, it was a, a very real issue at this time. President Kennedy met with the collegiate All-American football team at the Oval Office today. Now, the really good thing about meeting the president... One of the really groundbreaking elements of Forrest Gump is that it superimposed Tom Hanks with all of these uh, historical characters such as uh, presidents, such as Kennedy as we see here. <laughs> and uh, it makes for some, some great scenes uh, in the film. Forrest Gump. Now, can you believe it? After only five years of playing football, I got a college degree. Congratulations. This uh, point in the movie with Forrest graduating is one uh, major digression, one of many, um, between the film and the book. Uh, in the book, Forrest is about uh, six foot six. Um, he's a very large, some might even say obese individual, uh, not at all uh, like the, the thin athletic version of Tom Hanks here. And um, in the book, Forrest drops out of college. Um, and so there, there are major discrepancies between uh, the literary and the cinematic, but I definitely encourage you to check out the novel sometime, uh, despite its differences from the beloved film adaptation. So Bubba was from Battery, Alabama, and his mama cooked shrimp. And her mama before her cooked shrimp. And her mama before her mama cooked shrimp, too. You have to love these historical overlays. Um, because it really adds textures to the, uh, to the characters. And it shows them as uh, products of the South in one form or another, or products of American history in various forms. Shrimp. Everything goes all right. Two men, shrimp in 10 hours, less what you spend on gas. You can Dundra, Sergeant! As a point of historical reference here, they are assembling and disassembling M14s. Uh, which was a weapon to be uh, in the middle ground between the M1 Grand and the M16 as the United States Army was gravitating into the Vietnam War. Shrimp and potatoes, shrimp burger, shrimp sandwich. That's, that's about it. And of course we now have Bubba Gump Shrimp Company restaurants as a fine tribute <laughs> to this film. Turns out Jenny had gotten into some trouble over some photos of her in her college sweater. Playboy magazine was only a, a few years old uh, by this point in American society and uh, it really kind of broke down the, the sexual barriers of what was deemed accessible, what was deemed acceptable um, in some circles. And uh, certainly that magazine showed up in many barracks uh, as is the one that Forrest was just in. Vietnam was going to be very different from the United States of America 
except for all the beer cans and the barbecue, it was. In the context of filming this movie, Vietnam was not different at all from the United States because these scenes were actually filmed in the vicinity of the Combahee River in South Carolina, only a short distance away from where the Gump family home set was constructed. And so um, this is actually uh, filmed near the South Carolina coast and uh, it's mocked up pretty decently uh, to look like the, the jungles of Vietnam, particularly the Mekong Delta, uh, which is in and of itself a very marshy place, much like the South Carolina coast. There is one item of GI gear that can be the difference between a live grunt and a dead grunt. Socks. Cushion sole, OD green. I've interviewed so many Vietnam War veterans who have said something to this extent and can really relate to this scene. Just the impossibility of staying dry in Vietnam. Um, always marching through rice paddies, the humidity, the, the consistency of the rain, it was just impossible to, to stay dry, especially your feet. Somebody in his family had fought and died in every single American war. My, my favorite montage uh, in the film, all of Lieutenant Dan's uh, ancestry <laughs> fighting and dying in the various American wars really rich kind of historical fabric in this film. Two standing orders in this platoon. One, take good care of your feet. Two, try not to do anything stupid. We can see from the, the patch on uh, Forrest's left shoulder um, that he is a member of the 9th Infantry Division, known as the Old Reliables. And indeed, they were stationed in the, the Mekong Delta uh, region where they were in this constant cat and mouse game uh, fighting uh, uh, Viet Cong insurgents. They were heavily involved in the pacification efforts um, here in South Vietnam as they were known. And uh, as these scenes and future scenes in the film will indicate, the division had a very difficult time and uphill battle um, in regard to rooting out the enemy. It seems like this, where they are on patrols, uh, were, were daily activities in the lives of these GIs. And they constantly had to contend uh, not only with Mother Nature, uh, but uh, hidden landmines, uh, punji sticks, and various assorted other booby traps uh, that the Viet Cong uh, left behind. Um, so, indeed, it was a very deadly affair in which uh, these guys found themselves. Yeah, check out that hole. And there was always something to do. One of the most dangerous things a GI could do in Vietnam, as we see here, was being a so-called tunnel rat. And I've spoken to a number of such uh, individuals and my God, what a, a scary assignment uh, that was, uh, crawling down into these dark, thin labyrinths uh, in which the enemy was essentially awaiting for you. Uh, so, man, tense stuff. Rain flew in sideways. And sometimes rain even seemed to come straight up from underneath. Uh, surprisingly, uh, with some of these rainstorms, with at least uh, one veteran who I've, who I've interviewed and has come and spoken in my classroom, um, as he said that sometimes the rains in Vietnam, depending on what part of the country you were in, um, could actually be really cold. You know, you'd, you'd think that it would, you know, give a lot of high humidity and, and make it even more miserable. But, you know, there were times where he had to wear, you know, two jackets and a poncho. Um, trying to stay warm in Vietnam um, of all places and so the unpredictability of this weather that these soldiers had to confront uh, was just one of many hurdles that were faced. And the sun come out. You know, even though this movie is not strictly about the Vietnam War and I wouldn't categorize it as a war film, um, this scene here in which 
the, the men of uh, Forrest's platoon are ambushed, I think is one of the, the finest scenes depicting combat in Vietnam. Um, and a number of individuals who uh, were there and experienced similar situations um, have said much the same thing. You know, just the, the unpredictability of it, the volatility of it. Uh, the the all-consuming nature that would just you know eat up these men as they were marching across these rice paddies and, and jungles, and uh, you know the, the special effects here you know it just captures the intensity of it bar none, um, and it's uh, it, it's a really high standard. Movers are inbound at this time. Over. Then it felt like something just jumped up and bit me. <laughs> Of all wounds to receive, getting bit in the rear end, so to speak, uh, was perhaps the lesser of all evils, um, especially when considering what awaits poor Bubba. Of the Vietnam veterans I've interviewed, um, so many of them said that, you know, by far, the worst sort of wound was a gut wound. And, you know, one reason why that was so is because, you know, you're in Vietnam, you're always thirsty because it's so frequently hot and they couldn't give these guys water. Uh, one young lieutenant from West Virginia who I, I once interviewed for a grad school project I was really close friends with a South Vietnamese advisor and uh, one day this advisor stepped on a landmine and uh, pretty much uh, severed the lower half of his body and uh, this South Vietnamese ally was uh, begging for water and knowing that he wasn't going to make it this lieutenant gave him water and as a result of that uh, the water just gushed out the lower part of this man's body and uh, the, the South Vietnamese soldier died in this lieutenant's arms um, and so you know uh, scenes like this in which you know Forrest is uh, clutching Bubba and you know and is with him in his final moments there's a strong degree of truth and sincerity to moments like that because I've I've heard such stories from such individuals on a, a first-hand basis and I'm sure as may have been the case with Forrest's character um, it's something that never left these guys Napalm was heavily used in Vietnam. It was uh, first devised during uh, the Second World War uh, with the, the hopes of being used against the Japanese and it was in, in many instances but in the Vietnam War is where it was uh, really used quite extensively and uh, much like something like Agent Orange you know, it, it was meant to eliminate the enemy from these thickly vegetated areas. Um, and as we saw from this past scene, it was often quite effective in doing so. Lieutenant Dang, I got you some ice cream. Lieutenant Dang, ice cream. In the book Forrest Gump, uh, it's here in the hospital where Forrest actually meets Lieutenant Dan for the first time. In the book, uh, Lieutenant Dan was not his commanding officer um, in his platoon, and so here yet is another uh, deviation. Gump, how can you watch that stupid Rough shit? Turn it off. You are due to the American forces, Vietnam. And playing in the background is the. Uh, spin-off of the Andy Griffith show that was known as Gomer Pyle USMC uh, which is a very interesting cultural product um, of the Vietnam War era and uh, you know we we get this sense of you know Americans were trying to figure out how to look at the military establishment of course Gomer Pyle uh, took a very uh, a lighthearted and comedic view in some cases of military service but uh, from that show in certain episodes uh, came conversations about the war in Vietnam and on a more serious note as Jenny finds out later on uh, these conversations were going to grow in their intensity Damn, 
This, of course, did not happen, but I could definitely see uh, a Lyndon Johnson who sometimes had a, a, a macabre and a dirty sense of humor. I could definitely see him uh, enjoying uh, something like this. And it, if you want to watch something really funny and get a sense of how coarse Lyndon Johnson could be at times, uh, go to YouTube and search LBJ orders pants and you'll hear one of the best presidential phone calls that you've ever heard as a historical document. Go check it out. Hey, you're a good man for doing this. Good. Okay. And of course, one of the many great songs uh, playing here in the background in this case is Volunteers by uh, Jefferson Airplane, uh, which uh, speaks to uh, kind of the, the civic mentality, if you will, um, of a lot of young people, those involved in the counterculture, and those, of course, protesting the war in Vietnam. This rally in front of the Lincoln Memorial uh, actually did occur in the fall of 1967 and of course uh, Abby Hoffman, the curly haired guy in the American flag shirt was a participant in that uh, and they thereafter marched on the Pentagon in which they were greeted by members of the 82nd Airborne who uh, formed a human barrier around the Pentagon so this crowd uh, could not descend upon the home of the military. Um, but the fact that uh, uh, the cord is plugged here as uh, Forrest Gump is, is giving his speech. You know, I, I've always thought of Forrest as kind of a member of, of the silent majority. Um, you know, he's kind of this quiet, humble, patriotic American, but he doesn't really have a clear sense of all the social issues that are ongoing in the United States. He's kind of oblivious to it. Um, and this is, in my mind, symbolic of that demographic that Richard Dixon called uh, the silent majority. Um, believing in traditional values, but perhaps we're not fully aware of the implications and all the social changes that were gripping the United States at this time. And I, I can't help but think that Forrest being made silent here as he's talking about the war in Vietnam isn't some sort of artistic tip of the hat to that sort of historical theme. Who's the baby killer? This is my good friend I told you about, this is Forrest Gump. Forrest, this is Wesley. Uh, but from a material culture standpoint, it's interesting to point out that uh, Wesley's uniform uh, is an East German military uniform, and this undoubtedly speaks to his uh, kind of uh, left-wing radicalism um, that was uh, apparent in certain circles of uh, Students for a Democratic Society, also known as uh, SDS, uh, of which he is a member. And, uh, you know, here in the film, too, uh, you know, we, we get a very hostile um, interpretation of, of the Black Panther Party. Um, and certainly there were violent elements of the Black Panthers and they got into uh, various firefights with police officers in a, a number of cities throughout the late 1960s and the early 1970s. And it, it's around this time when the movie is set that the Black Panthers were at the peak of their political power. They had close to 5,000 members uh, nationwide and uh, you know they had their their signature black leather jackets, their black berets, there was a, a militant military type quality to, uh, to them and um, one of their, their other signature features um, is that they, they open carried weapons um, and of course this was something that was very controversial uh, at, at the time uh, because um, in, in large segments of white society um, there was nothing perceived as more dangerous than a black man with a gun. Um, and so the, the Black Panthers uh, continually challenged this, uh, notably in, in places like California uh, where they did armed demonstrations in the, the Sacramento State House. Um, but on top of that too, and uh, a, a depiction that we don't get as much in this film, um, is that the Black Panthers were really involved in kind of grassroots community activity. Um, they started 
uh, breakfast programs for children, they started health clinics, they were providing all these sorts of social services um, that often had been denied to the African American community in urban areas. Um, and so um, not everything was about wearing black berets and carrying weapons, uh, but in their minds contributing back to the community in one form or another. Um, and that's uh, a shade of the Black Panthers uh, that we don't quite get as much in Forrest Gump. In many ways, it's kind of the perfect representation of America in the 1960s, um, being torn between these two ideals, these two lifestyles, uh, different visions of where the country is going. Uh, you know, Wesley, you know, represents this kind of a new and more radical way of life for us, a more traditional point of view, an Alabama country boy. Um, and in a scene like this, you know, Jenny is caught in the middle. Um, and that is so symbolic of how so many young people in America felt in 1967, um, being pulled between their friends and their family members, uh, people that they met in college versus people that they had grown up with. It's a very revealing moment. I was so good that some years later, the Army decided that I should be on the All-America Ping Pong team. We were the first Americans to visit the land of China. Americans being sent to communist China to play ping pong was a very real thing. And in fact, it was known as ping pong diplomacy. And um, what this ultimately symbolized was a thawing of long-standing Cold War tension between the United States and China. Um, the United States had uh, essentially broken off all diplomatic ties uh, with China for the better part of two decades or more since um, the, the Communist Revolution in the late 1940s. Um, and so um, this, the success, the, the diplomatic success of Americans going to play something as simple as table tennis uh, ultimately paved the way for Richard Nixon's uh, groundbreaking 1972 visit to China, him being the first president uh, to go visit that communist country. Um, and so uh, uh, it was a very real thing, uh, this idea of ping pong diplomacy, in which forced the character takes part. Uh, here he is, Forrest Gump, right here. Gump. And of course, here we see a, a recreation of the, the Dick Cavett show. And uh, uh, Dick Cavett uh, plays himself, uh, the, the popular talk show host uh, from the early 1970s. And uh, it, just, it just works so well, um, because these were the very sorts of uh, real and a serious yet comedic conversations that this uh, talk show host uh, would have. Suck it! Hey, hey, hey! Are you fine? I'm walking here! Ah, get out! Come on, come on, come on! And of course that line is a tip of the hat to uh, the famous Dustin Hoffman line in Midnight Cowboy, which comes out uh, around this same time. Have I found Jesus? They even had a priest. Come and talk to me. He said, God is listening, but I have to help myself. These sorts of existential conversations that uh, Lieutenant Dan dives into are, are, are very representational of a lot of the, the emotions and views that Vietnam War veterans confronted and faced when they returned home. Um, because, of course, uh, many of, of these veterans were horribly treated on top of any uh, physical or emotional wounds they, they may have suffered from. And there was, a, I think, a true sense of bewilderment um, as they tried to cope with what they had just gone through, as they were trying to uh, cope with how society was treating them and perceiving them. And uh, the, the frustration was a very real thing. And uh, Gary Sinise's, you know, iconic performance in, in this film uh, perfectly encapsulates a, a, a lot of that frustration and resentment. Yeah, sir, you might want to send a maintenance man over to that office across the way. The lights are off and they must be looking for a fuse box or something because in flashlights, they're keeping me awake. And uh, of course, what we see here 
Our uh, <laughs> cronies of Richard Nixon breaking into Democratic Party headquarters in June of 1972 at the hotel and office complex known as the Watergate Hotel along the, the Potomac River. Um, in reality, uh, these uh, burglars who were trying to dig up dirt on Democrats a few months before the 1972 election uh, were discovered by a security guard who worked at the Watergate Hotel. He called the police and uh, three uh, plainclothes police officers who were actually dressed as hippies uh, showed up at, at the Watergate and found these guys in the act. And of course, that knocks down the first domino that will eventually lead to the capitulation and resignation of Richard Nixon in just, well, less than two years' time. So, but it, it, this, uh, this hypothetical version of uh, the Watergate Hotel incident uh, certainly makes for a colorful one here in the film. So anyway, I'm putting all that on gas, ropes, and new nets, brand new shrimp and boat. Bayou Labatry, Alabama is known as uh, the, the shrimping capital of Alabama and uh, quite the, the fishing port uh, that it remains even to this very day and of course it was uh, exceedingly active in that capacity in the 1970s. This is the scene in which the, the extent of Jenny's descent into the abyss becomes uh, apparent to audiences. And um, once again, it, it presents this uh, really stark dynamic of, of different Americas. You know, Forrest is always seemingly trying to do the, the wholesome and right thing, even if he's not fully aware of his uh, surroundings. Um, and meanwhile, the counterculture is uh, seemingly destroying Jenny, and it, it quite literally uh, brings her to, to the brink. Um, and so, uh, you know, you could interpret this as a political or social commentary in a historical sense, if you wish. Um, but, you know, ultimately, it, it's, it's a love story of two different people who are torn together by the drama of this historical moment. I think that's perhaps the healthiest way uh, to look at the film. came through here yesterday destroying nearly everything in its path. Uh, the storm that is depicted in the film is Hurricane Carmen and uh, this took place in September of 1974 uh, along the Gulf Coast and uh, you know just it was incredibly destructive. It, it killed eight people but there was uh, a storm surge of something like 16 feet um, and it, it really uh, you know, ravished, you know, a, a lot of uh, the fishing industry there uh, along the coast. Um, and in fact, it was uh, one of the most uh, destructive of uh, such storms until Hurricane Katrina struck that same vicinity in 2005. Um, and so uh, the boat Jenny uh, was uh, very fortunate indeed to have survived such a calamity. Where are you running off to? I'm not running. <laughs> These scenes like lead to the question, what sort of person is Jenny? I mean, uh, she uh, comes and goes and she like emotionally manipulates this guy and you know, like she leaves him, she dumps him, she goes back to him. Um, like what's her deal? Um, and I, I think the answer here is, is that she's, she's haunted by her past, that she loves this guy. Uh, but uh, it, it reminds her of home in being with him. Uh, and that is apparently uh, something that is too painful to bear. That's my interpretation of it anyway. Make <laughs> what you will of it. I ran clear to the ocean. Yeah, you know, in, in a way, um, in, in a unusual sort of way, I can really connect with uh, Forrest's cross-country journey because uh, his, his journey is set somewhere around 1976 or 1978. Um, and in 1978, uh, my father 
uh, did a cross-country bicycle trip uh, across the United States. And uh, I often plug my books on, on this program, but uh, this evening I'll, I'll plug his book. Uh, he talks about this trip, this odyssey of sorts, um, in depth in his book entitled Winding Roads. Uh, this is, book two is available online. And, uh, you know, I like to think that uh, he encountered a lot of the same sort of people and scenes uh, that Forrest did in his own cross-country journey. And when I first saw this movie in, in the 1990s, uh, when, when I saw Forrest running, um, in a funny sort of way, I also thought of my dad going across the country. And my dad was also born in the same year as Tom Hanks. Um, and so there was a lot of uh, uh, connection there, association, uh, that I was able to, to attribute to this movie. I'd think a lot about Mama, Bubba, Lieutenant Dane. And as a fun bit of cinematic trivia, um, it was actually uh, Tom Hanks's brother uh, who was... Uh, the extra, if you will, who was involved in a lot of these uh, running scenes and these very uh, scenic vistas uh, that we see. At 2.25 p.m., as President Reagan was leaving the Washington Post of five or six gunshots were fired by an unknown would-be assassin. We're able to uh, date these scenes as we get near the end of the movie. Uh, we, we see the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan. Uh, which took place only a few weeks after his inauguration in, in 1981. Um, and so uh, that places us in the moment at the end of the film. We're able to put a, put a date on when uh, Forrest visits Savannah, and that is the year 1981. This is my very good friend, Mr. Gump. Here, can you say hi to him? Hello, Mr. Gump. Hello. Oh, can I go watch TV now? Yes, you can. And of course here, young Forrest, we see a young Haley Joe Osmond, um, just about five years before he sees dead people. Forrest, I'm sick. I have some kind of virus and the, the doctors don't, they don't know what it is. With the film now being set and established in the early 1980s and as uh, Jenny contemplates her, her sickness, uh, it is supposed uh, that, that she possibly has, has AIDS and uh, that is uh, what is slowly eating away at her life. Um, and yeah, I think from a narrative standpoint, um, you know, that th this is a, a representation of, of her falling off the wagon, so to speak. You know, perhaps it was her sharing drugs or needles or, or something like that in her troubled past uh, th that led to this moment. Um, and so, you know, this, this sort of critique of Jenny's lifestyle, we're going to circle back to here in a little bit. Lieutenant Dane. Hello, Forrest. You got new legs. New legs. I think it's safe to say that this movie, and particularly the role of Lieutenant Dan, changed the trajectory of Gary Sinise's career and his life. Um, because him uh, playing this role of, of Lieutenant Dan, a wounded warrior, uh, has, has really nurtured in him um, an appreciation for those who have served in the military. Um, in the years since, he has been a, a very active and compassionate advocate uh, on behalf of veterans' causes, and that may not have happened in the manner that it has had it not been for this movie. And so um, this is a prime example of how movies can change people's lives for the better. Not only is it an inspirational and at times comedic tale, a coming-of-age story in a very divisive time in American history, um, but beyond that, in regard to the film's legacy, uh, one of its greatest legacies may be the charitable works of actor Gary Sinise. You died on a Saturday morning. I had you placed here under a tree. If uh, Jenny did in fact die of AIDS, uh, Forrest would certainly not have been alone in his grieving. Um, and throughout the 1980s, this is something that was claiming tens of thousands of lives. And... It, Doctors just didn't really know that much about it to begin with. 
Um, in fact, they thought that it was a, a rare form of cancer that was growing uh, more widespread. Um, and so um, this uh, sort of just a lack of knowledge on it, um, ambivalence on the, the part of politicians uh, who, you know, uh, stigmatized it as uh, something being associated with the homosexual community, uh, really hindered America's ability to confront this public health challenge. Um, and, you know, luckily in the decades since, great strides have been taken um, in combating this illness. Okay. Hey, I know this. I'm going to serve that for so and tell because Bram used to read it to you. I think one thing that Forrest Gump does do effectively is that it shows that uh, individuals with disabilities can be uh, functional, successful members of society. Forrest becomes a millionaire, a Medal of Honor recipient, a good and loving father. Uh, so yeah, that's, I think, uh, a positive vibe to, to keep in mind in regard to, to Forrest Gump. And here too, this of course is open to your interpretation, but you know, I've, I've always given thought to this uh, feather floating at the end that it's uh, kind of symbolic of Jenny's free spirit. Uh, departing forest for uh, one final time and she is she has left him with a, a, a son though um, in, in the broad scheme of things a, a son who is uh, uh, sharp uh, who's, who's on the ball and uh, leaves forest a, a legacy ultimately to wrap things up I mean everybody has has seen this movie everybody loves this movie uh, to a large extent and I, I think one reason why it's so is because everybody can connect to this uh, historical tale this odyssey in in one form or another um, but it's it's led to some really interesting conversations in regard to the historical memory of the 1960s and these are some very lively discussions that I have with uh, students in my class that I teach about 1960s America and the, the consensus that uh, students often come to having uh, learned about all the, the volatility of the 1960s and all the changes that society went through, um, that ultimately Forrest Gump is a movie that is a condemnation of the counterculture. And the character of, of Jenny is kind of the vehicle for exploring that. Um, you know, she, she goes out, she tries to, to find herself, she protests the war, she, she goes to college, she goes to California. And what does that ultimately get her? It gets her uh, drug addiction, living like a transient, uh, ultimately claiming her life uh, as a result. And, uh, you know, and of course, Forrest is representational of the silent majority, uh, a more traditional side of America that is somewhat uh, oblivious or out of tune with all of the change that is engulfing them. Um, and so these are some really interesting things to keep in mind from a historical perspective as we watch Forrest Gump. Naturally, it, it, it's a comedy, it's a fun-loving movie, it is often heartwarming, um, but it also tells us something about the 1960s. And like many historical movies, it tells us about the time in which it was made in the 1990s. And the film's ongoing popularity simultaneously tells us something about ourselves, where we currently stand in society. And so these are things that I'd like you to keep in mind the next time you catch a rerun of Forrest Gump on television. As always, I, I like to recommend additional reading to offer some uh, historical context. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, my dad wrote a story about his life that in many ways uh, chronologically and sometimes thematically overlaps with that of Forrest Gump. And uh, it's called Winding Roads, A Bicyclist's Journey Through Life and America. And uh, the book culminates in my dad's 1978 cross-country bicycle journey that in my mind at least uh, mirrors certain aspects of uh, Forrest's journey across the country as well. And uh, it, it says a lot about America in the 1960s and the 1970s and uh, about a young man trying to 
find his way in life. Um, so if, if you like a good travel log book uh, that has a lot of rich historical background, uh, you can find my dad's book, uh, John Frederick, Winding Roads. You can find it online. Um, two other books that I'll recommend. If you want some really good perspective on uh, Forrest Gump's Alabama and uh, the, the historical time period uh, in which his character lives there, um, there's a, a really good book, a very telling book uh, about George Wallace by Dan Carter entitled The Politics of Rage. Um, and so if you want a, a good understanding of some of the political and racial dynamics that were gripping Alabama at that time, um, this offers a, a rather searing interpretation of uh, a a, a more troubled uh, interpretation or version of Alabama than we sometimes get in Forrest Gump. Um, and then finally, uh, for some uh, broad perspective, um, here is the book that I assign my students in my 1960s America course. And it is A Hard Rain by Fry Gaylord. And uh, in my mind, it is the, the most comprehensive overview of the United States in the 1960s. Um, it is a rich narrative, it moves chronologically, and uh, it, is, it is the best thing for a textbook and, and a class as such. Also available online. If you want to learn about 1960s America, this is the one to do it. So there's some homework for you until next time. I hope this episode has been insightful. I hope you gained some new perspective on this beloved classic from the 1990s. And we'll see you next time on Real History. Life is like a box of chocolates.